discussion. Uh, tonight, uh, we are uh, lucky enough to be uh, hosting uh, through hospital for uh, special surgery. Uh, I have uh, several of my colleagues uh, and our fellows that'll be involved. Um, Dr. Uh, Chevy Iyer, uh, who is uh, one of our attendings, is going to be uh, speaking on a single position surgery. And then our fellows will be uh, presenting some uh, cases and some uh, relevant literature. Uh, we've also, I know, have uh, been uh, Sandu um, on with us as well, who's uh, the chief of our service. Uh, and thanks to uh, Seattle Science Foundation and uh, Texas Back Institute uh, for organizing this and asking us to be involved. So I'm going to start tonight just uh, by talking a little bit about uh, some of the technical advances in minimally invasive spine surgery. Um, you know, the, uh, the forum tonight uh, is really uh, our opportunity to discuss some of the intraoperative uh, imaging advances in spine surgery uh, and specifically its impact on being able to do things less invasively, uh, more safely, and perhaps uh, more effectively. So I think um, I always like to start with just talking about the fact that there's really no definition for minimally invasive spine surgery. I think we'd all agree that we know what non-invasive procedures are. I think we know what maximally invasive procedures are, although I hate the word maximally invasive because I think we all try to be as, as uh, less invasive as possible. But minimally invasive tends to be this large sort of black box in a way of a variety of different procedures um, and there's really no true definition for what minimally invasive spine surgery is. I think probably the worst thing to have happened to minimally invasive spine surgery, uh, you know, maybe some of these advertisements uh, from uh, a decade or more ago from the Laser Spine Institute. Um, and, and the reason is not because I don't believe in laser spine surgery, although, you know, they don't exist anymore. Uh, but I think it was because it was uh, primarily using uh, a marketing gimmick uh, as opposed to really advancing spine surgery. And what it led to was that there were several naysayers around minimally invasive spine surgery who questioned the clinical effectiveness because the literature just wasn't there. Uh, it was suggested that it was hard to reproduce in other people's hands, that complications were underreported. And, and so some of the early um, things were that, you know, we really should have been focusing on the improved efficiencies and outcomes uh, by doing things less invasively. I think some of the keys to success when we're thinking about minimally invasive surgery and ultimately uh, how to advance it are that we can't change our indication. So if we stick to operating for things like spinal stenosis, spinal instability, or spinal deformity, uh, I think that we're always gonna have a good outcome and the goals can't change either. So if we're dealing with stenosis, we wanna make sure that we're doing a good decompression. If we're dealing with instability, we wanna make sure that we're stabilizing the segment. And if we're dealing with deformity, we wanna optimize alignment. And it's really these goals that ultimately are gonna get us the best results. The tools are, are what have advanced. And this is what is, has allowed us as minimally invasive surgeons to take on uh, more challenging cases and expand our indications uh, for what we are able to do minimally invasively. Some of the things that you see in this picture, including tubular retractors, bayoneted instruments, uh, those things haven't changed. And you know, we often say that the uh, tube is sort of like the minimally invasive surgeon's cob. It's really kind of our, our workhorse tool, but it's really what the visualization intraoperatively that has allowed us to do more things safely and more things effectively, starting with just simple things like a microscope but then more to advanced technologies like robotic surgery, which we'll be talking about uh, as we move forward. When we're thinking about things like uh, dealing with a patient with spinal stenosis, you know, one of the things that I often hear is that, well, I think that this amount of stenosis is too much uh, to handle minimally invasively, that, that, there's, that the stenosis is too severe. And, and I would say that I think it's really about uh, again, sticking to the goals of surgery and doing this minimally invasively in and of itself is possible. Here you can see uh, a full decompression of the bilateral dural sac or unilateral port. Uh, and minimally invasive surgery in and of itself can allow uh, for a, a thorough decompression even of significant stenosis. Here you could see a post-operative MRI uh, that we had gotten on a patient who had severe L3-4 stenosis. The reason for this MRI was that this patient uh, had 
just complaints of more back pain than what I was comfortable with postoperatively. You could see a lot of fluid in the facet joints. That speaks to sort of a different pathology, but I, I like to use this as an example of, of what we can see as a, as a very nice bilateral decompression for central and lateral recess stenosis uh, done through a unilateral port. And you can really <clears throat> remove all of the hypertrophic ligament and portions of the bilateral uh, facet joints when necessary. Dealing with things like spinal stenosis and spondylolisthesis, again, lots of different ways to treat this problem. Um, but doing, the, doing these things minimally invasively can be effective. And when we think about our goals, you know, when we look at the top here, we could see that this cage was placed uh, a little too posterior, so we didn't optimize alignment. But the bottom pictures show uh, better cage positioning can result in, in more optimal alignment. And why are patients and surgeons ultimately interested in minimally invasive surgery? Uh, we looked at our own patients and just looking at things that patients are interested in, such as functional outcomes and return to daily activities. And what we found that doing minimally invasive decompressions and minimally invasive fusions allowed patients to return to driving, return to work, stopping narcotic medications um, at really short time periods, you know, within a month, um, patients were able to return to work after fusion surgery. Uh, they were able to return to driving in around two weeks and discontinue narcotics at one week. And what it really changes is that, especially in the fusion cohort, what I found surprising was that patients really behaved very similarly to a decompression, whereas I think sometimes in open surgery, there could be a significant difference. The tools again, uh, you know, have changed. And that's really the crux of our talk tonight. So this is a picture of my operating room when I was at Mount Sinai. Uh, I think this is probably about 11 years ago now. We can see we're doing a minimally invasive surgery. There's a microscope draped in, but we see guide wires coming out of this patient's back and we see a fluoro unit that's draped in. So we heavily relied on uh, x-ray intraoperatively. And I think in a lot of places, um, this is still where minimally invasive surgery is stuck. But there are issues with this, and, and those issues are that, you know, the workflow is different. Number one, you have to have a C-arm that's draped in. Uh, you generally have to put in guide wires, and there can be complications of that. And of course, fluoroscopy can be challenging because of the radiation. And this is not just radiation to the patient. This is radiation to the surgeon who's doing these cases over and over again, uh, multiple times a week, multiple times a day, and to the remainder of the uh, of the surgical team that's in the OR. Here's just a example of a fluoroscopically based uh, minimally invasive t -lift. And I just took all these x-rays just from my iPhone. And you can see every time you see something moving, here's another x-ray, you can see my hand is getting radiated. In a little while, you'll see my fellow's hand get radiated. And sure, the outcome of the surgery is okay. You know, we're able to get everything accomplished. And I would say that certainly this may be the cheapest way to do a minimally invasive procedure because you don't have the sunk cost of navigation units and robotics. But when you think about the amount of x-ray that's being taken, if I just called out x-ray, 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 you know, and this is just picking up at the point where the cage is going in, there's a lot of radiation happening in these cases. It was something that was uh, that I was interested in, and I looked at sort of just my own learning curve that I had published. Uh, I think it just got recently published, but this was going back towards you know the start of my doing minimally invasive procedures. And even when I became proficient in the ter in terms of the case itself, my fluoroscopy time was still over two minutes. For uh, these were single level uh, MIST lift cases, um, and and so if you think about you know using two minutes worth of X ray. Uh, multiple times a day, multiple times a week, you know, the amount of radiation that's happening there is very significant. Additionally, you know, you deal with things like broken guide wires, putting in small cages, putting in uh, screws through facet joints uh, that can all be sources of pain. So, you know, doing fluoroscopically based uh, minimally invasive surgery, while I think it continues to be the current gold standard of minimally invasive surgery, I think in a lot of ways, you know, we need to move away from this. My interest in three-dimensional imaging in, in, in the operating room as, as it started when I was a resident and, and on our trauma rotation where we would start to do intraarticular fractures using 
um, an ISO C machine in the operating room to kind of get a sense of our intraarticular reconstruction. And I thought it made a lot of sense to be able to have 3D imaging in the operating room. I had transitioned my spine practice to doing uh, navigated spine surgery uh, several years ago now. And I was a big proponent of, uh, of what's shown here, which is skin-based navigation. So I didn't like the thought of having to deal with putting pins in the pelvis. Uh, I agreed with surgeons who were frustrated by the uh, pins and fiducial markers moving. Uh, and I liked the idea of an easy, easily placed uh, mask that was, uh, that's put on the patient's skin. Uh, and we looked at the accuracy of this. You can see here, um, this is probably now about four years ago, uh, doing this surgery, navigated, uh, we're doing a, a, a single level lumbar fusion. Uh, the spine mask is put up um, over the, uh, near the shoulders of the patient. So it's completely out of the field. We've got a great three-dimensional view of the uh, vertebral bodies and of what we're doing. Uh, and, and most importantly, you, don't, you, you can see we don't have to have a C-arm that's draped in. Um, the workflow for us changed a little bit. We would do an, I, I like to do an intraoperative spin using a zeme, but it could be done with any, uh, with any uh, intraoperative C-arm. I would place headless screws with uh, navigation. I would then dock my tube under a separate incision. This is just specifically for T-lift. Uh, and then really, I would just bring in the fluoro uh, when it was time to start to uh, place the uh, inner body implant. You can see sort of the nice view that you get with 3D navigation intraoperatively. You can work around uh, very enlarged facet joints um, and, and then use the uh, navigation also for tube docking. The biggest complaint that I get, you know, when I talk to surgeons about navigation is the time that it takes. You know, we looked at our own patients where we did, where we use navigation, not just for MIST lift, but also for microdiscectomies and laminectomies. We've also done the same with uh, lateral surgery now. Uh, but, but this was a paper that we published um, in, uh, in Spine Journal, and we found that the difference in time was only an additive time of five minutes in our MIST lift group um, for in, in patients who underwent navigation versus 2D fluoroscopy. But you can see the difference in fluoroscopy time. I mean, we went down to 26 seconds, and there was a significant difference in uh, not just the fluoroscopy time, but also the total radiation dose. Not only did the fluoroscopy time go down, but our pedicle screw placement became better. Uh, we can see here that uh, we did a regression analysis that showed that the odds of placing a poor screw, which meant uh, violating the facet joint or being too lateral or too medial, were twice as high when perk screws were placed uh, using fluoroscopy versus CT navigation. And most of those poor screws were proximal facet joint violations. How do we move towards better fusions? So sure, we can do a less invasive surgery, we can place our screws better, but what about the issue that a lot of uh, naysayers continue to say, well, if you do a minimally invasive surgery, you're really not getting a good fusion. Well, you know, there are different ways to try to battle that, certainly different graft options um, and different inner body cage implants, different surfaces. I had looked at my own fusion rates and minimally invasive T-lift that I published, and they were very poor when I used allograft. And with infuse, they got a little bit better, uh, but there are other problems with infuse, such as uh, neuroforaminal bone growth, as is shown here. When it comes to graft, I've actually gone backwards. As you can see here in the upper corner, the small opening, I've gone back to taking iliac crest autograft, uh, especially in uh, younger, healthier patients. Um, this is the autograft that you can get from uh, from between the tables. I think especially with navigation, it's very easy to navigate and, to, and remove this kind of graft uh, percutaneously with almost no soft tissue dissection. And that has really reduced um, the amount of pain that's associated and also um, any issues with regards to hematomas postoperatively. Um, but furthermore, I think you know using special instruments that allow us to uh, get a better end plate preparation can be valuable. Uh, some bayoneted instruments, both for curettes and, uh, and, and rasps and reamers. And what we found was that when we combined um, titanium implants with iliac crest autograph bone, you can see oh, finally our fusion rates exceeded 92%. This is CT-based uh, fusion rates uh, done at one year post-surgery. Expandable cages, I think, have a positive uh, impact 
especially when it comes to lordosis reconstruction. You know, I think in general, uh, minimally invasive surgeons are rightly faulted for not thinking about the consequences of creating deformity, especially in sync one and two level spine surgery infusions. But uh, I think the use of expandable technology and being able to place it anteriorly in the disc space, even in T-lift surgery, uh, has allowed improvement in this. This brings me now to sort of our current workflow, which is using uh, robotic surgery. Um, I know several people on the call have, uh, have experience with this, and we're going to be hearing uh, about this from uh, Chevy in, in just a few minutes. Um, I think where robotic surgery is going to make a difference is not only in screw placement, but really ultimately in the long-term outcomes in these patients. I get a lot of questions uh, from young surgeons asking, well, why, why robot over navigation? I think navigation allows for safety and accuracy, but I think robotics allows us to optimize the surgery to the next level when combining preoperative planning and intraoperative navigation. These are really to be looked at as additive technologies, not as competing technologies. What I think robotic surgery allows us to do is it allows us to look intraoperatively or preoperatively at the surgery that we're doing. We can try to size our pedicle screws better. I was always a 6545 pedicle screw placer at L4, L5. And I now routinely use seven, five and eight, five screws. I routinely use 55s and 60s. And I think for percutaneous screws, it's not just the angle, but it's the size. And, the, and I think the size of those screws is ultimately going to allow us uh, to get more stability, which will help us with fusion rates. With regards to my workflow, I use intraoperative planning. Um, you can see here, I, I, I took these pictures specifically to include the clock. So this was in, uh, taking a, you know, we got the intraoperative spin, we planned the four screws in our tubular docking, and we placed the fourth screw, and, and that took about 20 minutes of time to do. Uh, and I think that that's pretty standard, uh, you know, for intraoperative planning for a single level surgery. As we've advanced on this, you know, we've been able to do a little bit more uh, intraoperatively. And I think most importantly, we've advanced now from just being able to put in screws uh, using the uh, robotic arm to actually doing our disc prep and our, and our inner body planning. And I think that makes a big difference. So being able to plan the inner body, keeping it superimposed, seeing the curettes and the end plate prep instruments actually touching the areas where our planned implant was, and then placing the implant to be superimposed on our plan allows for what I think is sort of the current most accurate way uh, to be able to not only optimize alignment, but ultimately fusion rates. We are also now using uh, minimally invasive techniques for revision surgery. We've looked at this in a variety of scenarios, the recurrent disc herniation, the uh, patient who had a previous open surgery for decompression now being converted to a fusion, or the adjacent segment degeneration. And I think minimally invasive surgery, having the ability to do it navigated and using a surgical robot allows us to take on what would traditionally be thought of uh, as open surgeries. Um, when we do revisions in, uh, in a minimally invasive manner, what we found in our patients undergoing a variety of these procedures is that you could see that no patients required um, uh, a blood transfusion in the revision decompression or revision fusion group. Uh, there was one blood transfusion in patients who needed primary fusion. Um, there were no dural tears, EBLs were low, and you can see that uh, um, that length of stay went way down. So being able to do a revision surgery and the patient having a uh, recovery, at least in the perioperative period, that's more like a primary, I think can be a real advantage for minimally invasive techniques and the outcomes uh, in terms of patient reported outcomes uh, for lumbar surgery have been very good. We're also tackling deformity. I'm not gonna talk too much about that. I'm gonna leave this to Chevy, uh, but you know, being able to use lateral surgery and indirect decompression, uh, and then being able to combine that with doing robotic placement of inner bodies so that they're perfectly optimized to restore lordosis and then doing percutaneous instrumentation to include not only the lumbar spine, but the pelvis, I think allows us to tackle some more complex cases. Uh, this is just sort of a quick view of the workflow of what happens in lateral or single position surgery that Chevy will talk about in more detail, but the intraoperative planning 
placement of uh, screws in a lateral position. And then really, I, what I really like is again, being able to do the disc prep and place the uh, inner body implants. So you can do a multi-level lateral surgery and really minimize the number of x-rays that are being taken. Um, I think minimally invasive surgery is not just for the uh, lumbar spine. Uh, you know, we are doing it regularly in the cervical and the thoracic spine as well. The posterior cervical foraminotomy, I think, is particularly an excellent place for minimally invasive and navigated surgery, uh, especially when working down at the cervical thoracic junction in areas that can otherwise be challenging uh, to localize and to really get a sense of where we are. Uh, being able to get a nice view uh, is, uh, can, can be extremely helpful. So in closing, I think, you know, minimally invasive techniques are safe. And as we've added the ability to have an improvement in intraoperative imaging and guidance, uh, you know, we're really able to tackle more and more uh, challenging cases. I think the key is that the art of spine surgery is in the indication. And, uh, you know, we always want to use technology on real pathology. So if we stick to the right goals of surgery, uh, we should uh, always have uh, excellent outcomes. Thank you so much. And uh, I really appreciate everybody uh, listening. Uh, obviously happy to answer any questions and, um, and we will uh, move on shortly to uh, Dr. Iyer, who's gonna be talking about robotic assisted single position lateral surgery. Thank you. Great presentation, Scott Blumenthal here. Um, you, you did uh, um, definitely mention the challenge of a definition of minimally invasive surgery. And, you know, I think to a lot of people, it kind of is surgery through a tube. You might want to comment on that. The one thing that stuck out in your presentation, which I found really interesting, is in, you know, robotic planning to be able to put 7.5 and 8.5 screws in lumbar constructs, which for the most of us, we're like you. You know, six five forty fives has kind of been our bread and butter. Have you been able to kind of get any data on whether that improves either the radiographic fusion or clinical outcome improvement by putting more robust instrumentation in in the lumbar spine? Yeah, thanks, Scott, for the questions. Yeah, so I think um, you know your comment on the definition for minimally invasive surgery. I agree. I think most people consider it, you know, sort of you know, tubular surgery is minimally invasive. I, I think, I, I sort of think about it more like a sort of a variety of different uh, techniques where we're minimizing collateral soft tissue damage. Our group has uh, recently worked on uh, creating a classification system for minimally invasive surgery. We've sort of classified it from class one to class five based on uh, number of access points and, uh, and number of levels being treated. And we found that, you know, that really had an impact. So we're hoping to have a more definitive definition of, of how to classify minimally invasive surgery. Cause it's certainly one of the challenges that I run into is somebody's friend had a micro discectomy done through a tube. And, I'm, and we're now talking about a minimally invasive deformity reconstruction. And they're saying, oh, it's minimally invasive. Yeah, my friend had that done and they left the hospital the same day. And, and so, you know, they're, their expectations are completely off, you know, because uh, because we're dealing with a deformity. So I think definition and classification will be important. Uh, I think in terms of you know being, I am finding uh, just incredible screw purchase by putting in optimal screws. Uh, you know, I, I always joke. One of my fellows a couple of years ago, when I first started doing robotic surgery, I was like. I think we could put a nine five in this uh, L four. I mean, it looks like it fits perfectly. Mm -hmm. And he said, "But then, what's your revision strategy going to be?" And I was like, "You know, you're right. I don't know. I'm hoping not to have a revision." So I, I, I'm about now um, just uh, you know a, a little over a hundred robotic um, cases. I think we're you know probably about 150 levels. Uh, we're starting to get one year CT scans on sort of the first half of those uh, patients, and it's one of the things that we're going to look at is you know, are we um, sort of just, you know, getting better outcomes? Are people fusing uh, more predictably or faster or is, there, or is their fusion more robust? I, I have to imagine a, a more stable construct allows ultimately for better fusion or perhaps, you know, maybe the pseudoarthrosis isn't, uh, isn't painful anymore. You know, it's, it's, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I don't have a, a definitive answer, but it's just, you know, sort of my thoughts around it. I mean, I, I certainly like the feeling of putting a screw in that that looks like it 
absolutely fits the pedicle completely. Well, Raj, thanks we for have, a great presentation. Thanks. Raj, we have Izzy here. I, I'd be interested to hear what he oh, says yeah. about his pedicle screw size. Yeah, it I is didn't think he's on the call. Izzy, are you using the large pedicle screws like Shiraz is? No, I, I have not. What I have um, done is I'll use the length more than the width for the exact um, reason that Shiraz's fellow challenged him. If I have to come back, I want to know I still have more pedicle. And my patient population, they're pretty osteoporotic. There are a lot of deformities. So I don't hesitate to get anterior cortical purchase with my pedicle screws either. You'll, you'll see my x-rays, they're all long. The beauty of all of this, as, as Shiraz mentioned, was the preoperative planning. You can go into this and you know you're still gonna be perfectly safe. Now with the S2 AI screws, that's where I'll put the biggest screw possible that, that I can fit in there and try to get it right into the isthmus so I got a solid foundation. But uh, I must admit, I've, I've not filled up all the pedicles and multi-level constructs because I don't know that that really helps. But I suspect in a one or two level construct, that is an advantage. Well, what, what do you guys think about the calcium hydroxyapatite coated screws? Is that going to change how you would do it, Shiraz or Izzy? I, I don't know that that's going to change anything. I, I think the, the real issue is getting the fusion. Uh, yeah, you can have a better screw that holds. If you don't get a fusion, your rod's still going to break at some point. So what have we done as orthopedic surgeons? We get bigger rods. We get cobalt chrome rods. We get stronger rods, four rods, quad rod constructs, kickstand constructs. It doesn't <laughs> make any sense. It's the biology. Get the best possible fusion and your fixation is just your internal splint and cast. Like yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I mean, I agree, Izzy. I mean, I think getting longer screws and getting more stability, you know, it's a, you know, we always say it's a race, you know, hardware breaking versus getting the fusion. And so I think it just allows for more stability, which hopefully will allow for the fusion to occur more predictably. But I think, Rick, that's why, you know, I really like the inner body platforms now. You know, I mean, for so long, ro the robot has meant you know, pedicle screw placement. Now the robot, you know, really means inner body planning, inner body prep, being able to have your inner body superimposed and really being able to prepare it well, which I think, you know, again, appropriately so in MIS surgery, fusion rates, you know, traditionally have not been great because the disc prep is so much more challenging. Uh, but I think that that's where we're going to see a big difference in fusion is, is with the ability to sort of visualize where we're prepping the disc and then really superimpose the implant onto our plan exactly like we do with screws. Shiraz, have you seen or quantified less end plate perforation, less subsidence um, since you've been navigating in the interspace than when you were just doing it by feel with fluoro? Yeah, so I mean, I think some of it depends on bone quality, but, but Mike Steinhaus, who's one of our fellows, looked at that and uh, at the rate of subsidence and loss of reduction in patients who underwent navigated uh, MIS T lift and uh, and the rates are, are surprisingly low, uh, Mike. I think you probably can comment on the actual numbers uh, in uh, in your paper, but I thought I, I thought the percentages were pretty low. But it is something that we're going to look at also with uh, with our robotic uh, inner body work uh, in terms of our ability not to violate the end plate essentially, especially in lateral surgery. Looking at the use of robotics in the T lift, is that allowing you to get to the corners of the disc more efficiently that you wouldn't do with sort of an open or a MIS T lift? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's sort of a combination of things. I, I think number one, it's sort of you have to be committed to doing a good discectomy, right? I think a lot of MIS guys are what do they do like uh i think ahilan or one of our, our fellows is a neurosurgeon said oh this is way more than a neurosurgical disc uh, uh disc prep but uh i think it's like more it should be called an mis disc prep because so many people just kind of go in a couple of times and just pick out a little disc but i think part of it is just being commit at making the commitment that you're going to do a good discectomy but i think you're absolutely right you know i i think the jeff guys had published a paper that showed you know that the posterior the opposite side posterior corner is like the hardest place to actually get any disc out. I, I think we can predictably now see exactly the areas that the curette is touching 
Uh, and I think what, you know, hopefully the next step is going to be every place that you've prepped is going to change in color. So you're going to know exactly all the different places that you prepped uh, and that your curette has already passed uh, and that you've, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, remove cartilage. No, I think, um, yeah, I think in the interest of time, thank you very much for uh, all those questions. I think in the, let's move on to Chevy. Uh, who's going to be, you know, uh, talking about robotic assisted single position surgery. Uh, Chevy is a real expert in this. Uh, he's really dedicated his practice um, to, uh, to robotic surgery uh, and especially single position surgery. He's written about it uh, and does a tremendous amount of it. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the talk. Thanks, Chevy. Yeah, thanks, Ross. Thanks for having me, guys, and thanks again for for attending. Um, so, you know, I think that my interest in single position surgery, well, I think the general interest in single position surgery really comes because it comes at the confluence of a few different trends in spine surgery, sort of a growing interest in minimally invasive techniques, and Shiraz kind of outlined what that means increasing attention to alignment and sort of a greater belief in the power of indirect decompression. Um, so we kind of know from some of the data that the ISSG has published that MIS approaches are a valid way of treating at least some flexible curves and that in these curves, these approaches can be pretty effective in achieving your alignment goal. Certainly not in rigid curves, but in certain well-selected flexible curves, these approaches are um, a legitimate way of achieving these goals. And the, uh, there's growing evidence to suggest that indirect decompression is effective. This is actually a, a great paper from uh, this year in JNS. Uh, it was like the first thing I read during the quarantine. It was published in like March of 2020. But basically showing that indirect decompression may be effective even in severe cases of stenosis um, and that even though you see kind of this increase in canal cross-sectional area over time, the clinical outcome sort of improves right away. And you can kind of see here uh, the, the tremendous improvement you can see as the fusion occurs over the course of the year. Um, in this paper, they only treated people with severe stenosis and really only had to revise the folks that ended up having a pseudarthrosis, suggesting that providing stability, a little bit of unbuckling of the flavum can really result in good uh, decompression sort of other evidence, another paper recently um, where patients were treated, you know, all comers were basically treated with single position L4, L5 and L5, S1 or L4 to S1 fusion without a direct decompression, didn't, you know, care about whether it was central stenosis, foraminal stenosis, et cetera, um, and still only had three operations in this cohort for persistent symptoms. Um, uh, so, you know, you kind of have these trends sort of pointing in these directions and single position surgery really kind of encapsulate that. It sort of gives you all those benefits of working anteriorly to maximize your sagittal balance, achieve indirect decompression, provides a minimally invasive approach, and probably most importantly, it saves time. So there's a few authors that have looked at these, looked at these studies or looked at this technique, and really they found that you can achieve all of the same outcomes, but save about 30 minutes to an hour. And this is really using fluoroscopy before robotics and navigation. Uh, so there is, there are limitations, you know, so uh, Shiraz kind of touched on um, how fluoroscopy impacted his practice early in single position surgery prior to robotics and navigation suffered from the same limitation. This is uh, one of the earlier papers looking at this and, and really you can see about 15 seconds per screw or a minute per level and that's just to place the implants and then you're gonna add probably another 30 seconds to a minute just to do your, your inner body work. So that's one. And then the second is that there's a tremendous learning curve because you're placing screws working in what is an unfamiliar position to most surgeons. So, but that's not single position surgery today, right? So you have all the three things we talked about, um, but then um, you, you know, now have the power or the ability to use robotics. So, um, you know, I think that using robotics or adding robotics to this, uh, to this technique allows for safe treatment of a variety of pathology, significant time savings, less radiation. Um, probably improved outcomes for flexible, certain well-selected flexible curves. And probably most importantly, it just provides guidance in a position where most surgeons don't really have muscle memory yet. 
And like with any new technique, patient selection is obviously critical. So these are kind of the three questions I ask myself is, can I access laterally? Do I need a decompression? And can I place the downsided screws in, 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 in that single position? So the idea of lateral is kind of the classic things we think about when we think about lateral access, crest position, psoas morphology, any prior retroperitoneal approaches. Um, I personally don't do oblique approaches, but obviously that opens up uh, this technique to a larger potentially cohort of patients. Um, you know, thinking about access, looking at the crest relative to the L4, L5 disc space is always important. Um, you know, probably the most important thing is psoas morphology. So being wary of anteriorly translated or Mickey Mouse psoas, it, it narrows the corridor both for the oblique approach and a direct lateral approach because it pulls the, uh, pulls the plexus forward. Um, the second question is, do I need a decompression? I mean, as we saw, like indirect decompression, I do think is appropriate in a lot of cases, but important, you know, this is one of my own cases that I, I did an MRI at six months just to see, and, and you can see the tremendous improvement in the canal cross-sectional area. Uh, but important to, um, to sort of know the, the relative contraindication. So people with tall pre-op disc height severe bony stenosis. And, and even now in severe central stenosis, I certainly think twice before sort of um, blindly applying indirect decompression. And then the last question is, can I place the downsided screws? So, you know, it's important, you know, this particular case, I was, I was working at L3, L4, um, and looking at um, placing screws in this position. And you can see in levels with a high medial lateral angle, you can kind of uh, end up hitting the edge of the table there. Um, you know, so to look at this, you kind of have to think about particularly the downsided screws in patients with degenerative scoliosis. It's important to consider the rotation of the vertebral body when placing these screws. So for example, if you take the same patient and you rotate more towards the downside, you know, that ends up being a pretty reachable trajectory. But if because of their scoliosis, they're kind of rotated the opposite way, that quickly can become an unattainable trajectory just because you're going to be hitting the edge of the bed. Um, so, you know, I think that overall, I think that this is a good technique that sort of builds on a number of trends that already exist in spine surgery while enabling significant time savings. And I think the robot really um, enables a faster adoption of this while helping the learning curve be a little bit less steep for surgeons. And just like what Shiraz said, I think proper planning and patient selection is critical for success in these cases. So this is a case of mine. This was a 76 year old guy. I actually did a laminectomy um, a couple of years ago um, for L5 radiculopathy. He did well for about a year and a half, but then came back with some right-sided thigh pain related to foraminal um, stenosis. Um, you can see his past medical history there. Um, these are his uh, images. You can see his images on the left before the laminectomy. And on the right, you can see he had a you know relatively high grade spondylolisthesis before, but it was stable on flexion and extension. So we chose to do a decompression only um, and then elected to, you know, and then he came back now with foraminal stenosis. You can see here a close up of his MRI. On the CT scan, you can say he did develop pars fractures bilaterally, um, leading to that mobile spondylolisthesis, um, and then had uh, pretty severe uh, right-sided neuroforaminal uh, stenosis here that I thought was responsible for sort of the majority of his symptoms. So, you know, I thought L4 radiculopathy was really his driving factor. And, and you know, when you think about treatment options, these are all probably single position ladder, and I should say ALIF also, but these are all probably valid approaches to, to treat this problem. Um, in my hands, I think this is a great case for single position. He's had prior um, surgery posteriorly. He's a big guy, which makes it challenging to go in with revision scar tissue. Coming anteriorly allows you to access the, a large disc space and maximize your chances of achieving fusion while indirectly decompressing the foramen while his posterior decompression looks good. But doing it in a single position um, without robotics would be challenging. So this is, you know, this is kind of like the classic big guy. So he is a uh, uh, you know, same, same size spine and a much bigger patient. And that creates some challenges, particularly, as I said, when placing the downsided screws. So you, you realize that in a regular patient or, or, or a lower BMI patient, you'd have plenty of clearance from the bed when placing the screws. In a guy like this, you get a lot less clearance from the bed. The skin incision ends up being much lower and you can get um, draped out pretty easily. With the robot, 
you kind of can help overcome this because it, it, it really levels the playing field when it comes to technical difficulty of, of these two cases. And more importantly, it allows you to plan your screw trajectory to really um, avoid any potential problems um, when doing these types of cases. Um, so this is sort of the setup that I use, you know, the patient's positioned in a standard lateral position. And, and as we said, it's kind of important to have the patient all the way to the edge of the bed when you're thinking about these cases to make sure you don't get, you don't hit the edge of the bed as you're placing your screws. You have to drape low to ensure you have access, particularly for the downsided screws and particularly in, in a bigger patient. Um, I use a pre-op CT workflow. Um, so that uses a pre-op CT with less than one millimeters of slice thickness through the region of interest. So here, what we do is we place an array in the pelvis. Um, you bring the C-arm in um, and the side, you know, some, sometimes I do a, a a lift in the lateral position and then lateral um, uh, at, lateral uh, at the levels above, particularly in multi-level cases. So in those cases, I'll bring the C-arm in from the back, from the dorsal side of the patient. If I'm doing only a lateral, as in this case, the C-arm will come from the patient's front or the ventral side. Uh, but basically the C-arm takes a perfect AP and lateral X-ray, which merges it to the preoperative CT scan. Um, and you can see the camera here essentially finds out the position of the C-arm in space relative to the pelvic array you placed in the last step to do that merge. Once you verify that merge, and there's you know, various tools you can do to verify the accuracy of that merge, then the screw placement um, really comes next before we do any of the interbody work. I like to begin on the downsided screws because those are technically the most challenging and that's where I care the most about accuracy of the screw placement. Um, and again, when we plan the screws, again, this is the real key with the robot is you can plan them with your positioning in mind. So the downsided screws, you may plan them in a slightly more lateral angle versus the upsided screws knowing that you wanna make sure that the robotic arm can access the trajectory and that you can access it without hitting the edge of the bed. Um, so you, you, know, you drill first, uh, there's a burr tool as well to minimize your skiving risk. This is an important step. I think it's always important that just because the screen shows you one thing, not to forget the tactile feedback that you get. Um, there are better and more sophisticated tools now, particularly with these systems that give you some kind of warning when you might be skiving. But at the same time, it's important to always be thinking about the feedback that you're getting from the instruments and sort of using good technique to minimize that risk. But once that's placed, um, you can place the screws and you can see placing the screws in this position really is not too, um, not too difficult because um, the robotic, the rigid robotic arm is kind of there holding you in the right position and placing the screws becomes fairly, fairly straightforward. Um, now with the navigated solutions, you can start to navigate the interbody so as well. So uh, because you, you can plan the interbody just like you did with the screws, as Shiraz had mentioned, you can go right into your interbody once the screws are placed. So you use this navigated pointer to sort of plan your incision. Um, you send your dilators down docking using that navigated, uh, using the navigated dilators. Still early in my workflow with this, so I will get spot x-rays just to make sure before we do anything that we can't uh, take back. Um, uh, but once you're docked, you can, you can um, lock the lateral retractor to either a table mounted retractor or the robotic arm. It's just important to know that if you dock it to the robotic arm, the bed and the arm move independently of each other. So I had a case where the fellow came in and they dropped the, the, the table height and the retractor kind of pulled up. So it's just important to kind of know that it changes things a little bit from what we're traditionally used to with, with lateral cases. Um, the disc is prepared using the navigated instruments um, followed by the trial and then, and then the positioning of the implant. And you can see this was, this was the final result um, which ended up looking quite good. Um, so uh, thank you very much. I'll, I'll take any questions. Chevy, great, uh, great talk. When you're positioning for the laterals, uh, very often we're bending the patient uh, quite a bit. Does that, uh, are you taking that into account or do you just keep, I looked at the picture there and it looked like you kept the OR table pretty flat to do your laterals. Yeah, I mean, I, I do uh, tend to keep the OR table pretty flat, obviously minimize the bed break whenever possible. Um, uh, but it hasn't been an issue even in patients when I've needed to put in a little bit more bed break. The algorithm to merge the pre-op 
CT to the intraop x-rays is, is segmented. So it goes each segment independently. So that merging algorithm has been, has worked out well every time. If I do have any doubt, I would always be quick to do an intraop spin or CT. It would require changing the machine out and bringing, bringing um, you know, a, a, a Zeem machine in, but, but that's always something that I can fall back to if I have any concerns about accuracy or sort of the translation from, from the CT uh, to the intraop x-ray. One other question in terms of your workflow. Uh, in, in days past, when I used to do pelvic and acetabular fractures, we used a technique uh, that we called the sloppy lateral, where we'd have a bean bag and we'd have the patient uh, leaning one way when we're trying to get to the anterior column of the pelvis and leaning the other way. In your workflow, do you think you could do something like that where you get your screws in and the sort of sloppy lateral with the patient slightly supine and then bring them back, anchor them, and then get the, the cage in so you don't run into the table? And particularly for the obese patients, because their skin envelope moves all over the place and you don't know where their spine can be. Yeah, no, it certainly is a challenge. Um, I haven't tried a sloppy lateral position. The main reason is that once you do the registration, um, it, and that doesn't really make, it doesn't, it wouldn't matter, I think, if you do an intraop spin or if you do, um, you know, this, the image is the fluoroscopy. I think once we, if we change the position in any way relative to that pelvic array or relative to the camera at that point, I, I would just worry about the accuracy. So that's been my hesitation. What I will do is particularly in the more, so, you know, if you're doing an S1 screw, for example, or an S2 AI screw in that position, something more challenging, I will roll the table quite a bit because as long as sort of everything's moving in concert, it's not an issue. So that I've done in the past where I've like rolled the table way away from me to make the, it, it, cause it, it's not so much, I mean, I think the one relationship that doesn't change is the patient's spine to the bed, right? Cause they're all sort of taped in. So you kind of have to have them at the edge of the bed, but the robotic arm has limits to sort of where it can go. So that you can overcome by rolling the table away or towards you, but you, it's, it's almost like if they're too, too far away from the bed, they're, or if they're, you know, if you're hitting the edge of the bed, you're hitting the edge of the bed if they're rolled away or you're hitting the edge of the bed if they're sort of neutral. Charvi, listen, when I first saw the uh, single um, positioning approach, at first I thought this is really crazy. And then as you were presenting it, I was thinking, has anybody tried to do them in the prone position on a four poster and do the lateral inner body from in the prone position and then you do your screws in your normal position it's a much more natural way and i think to do the lateral inner body if the anatomy is such that you could do it would make it a lot easier and i think a lot more uh acceptable to the to the masses so to speak yeah no i think i think you know i haven't done it yet i've seen it presented i think it's a valid way of doing it i, I don't know if you could access four or five in that prone position but i certainly think for the upper lumbar levels it's a it's a, a good approach i think again there, like having you know i talked about that robotic arm being independent of the table but in that position it would almost be better to have a rigid robotic arm to hold that retractor because gravity may, might not pull that arm down if you have a table mounted retractor i'd almost worry about it sort of sliding down but having that hydraulic arm kind of hold it in place fixed might work out well so i i think that's certainly a place for it i haven't tried it yet but i've, I've seen it presented and i'm definitely curious so yeah rick i would say you know we're doing one coming up and uh you know I, i've only done it in the in, in a lab so far but you know the nice thing about it is that you know especially in these curves sometimes accessing one level from the left is optimal but accessing another level from the right is better so by having the patient in a prone position you also don't have to sort of be committed to sort of just coming in on one side <laughs> Uh, I think the point that Chevy raises is, is very important because, uh, you know, table mounted arm gravity can pull that down um, in the prone position. So I, I think that's going to be a surgery where robotic arm and potentially even a technology like an exascope, where you're going to be able to have a microscope without having to kind of look in, um, you know, to, to provide your picture uh, up on a screen is it, it's all going to be additive to, to doing these procedures in, in ways that are more uh, comfortable for surgeons across the board. 
This is fantastic discussion, but do you have some cases that? Uh, yes. So, sorry, Jack. Thanks for keeping us on time. <laughs> all right. Thank, uh, thank Linda. <laughs> uh, all right. Yes, we do have some uh, some cases. Uh, I think our first one's going to be uh, Ahilan Sivaganesan, who's uh, one of our fellows. Uh, he's a uh, uh, trained in neurosurgery at uh, at Vanderbilt, and uh, we're lucky enough to have him for the year. And uh, he's going to be presenting our first case. I think we have three cases total. We've only got about 10 minutes, guys. So, uh, you know, maybe we can uh, uh, get through as much of this as possible. Let's see. Go ahead, Alan. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I'll quickly present uh, a case of a robot-assisted MIST lift to sort things off. Um, so, 60-year-old male with a back and right leg pain. Um, the leg pain was in a uh, L5 distribution on the right. Um, couldn't sit, stand, or walk for more than five minutes. Um, exhausted all the conservative measures, physical therapy, uh, epidural steroid injections, and medications with, with no significant relief. Um, uh, intact neurological exam, um, uh, nothing particularly pertinent on the, on the exam. Um, but moving on to the, the, the scans here, here's the uh, e, actually EOS films showing a uh, seven millimeter L5S1 uh, spinal uh with a uh, coronal degenerative scoliosis as well. Um, here's a CT scan. You can see it's a lytic spondylolisthesis with bilateral uh, pars defects. The, uh, if you measure the uh, slip here on the supine scan, it's about four millimeters versus seven on the upright. So it, it was a dynamic uh, spondylolisthesis, um, uh, as you can see here. Here's the MRI. Um, you can see at L5S1, um, there is a broad base uh, disc bulge with uh, bilateral recess stenosis. And then if you look at the bottom, both at the right and the left uh, L5S1 foramina, you can see the expected uh, foraminal stenosis as well, worse in the right and the left, corresponding with the patient's symptoms. So in some rates, a patient with uh, bilateral L5 radiculopathy, low back pain, lytic spondylolisthesis, foraminal stenosis, and some lateral uh, recess stenosis as well. So um, uh, Dr. Kreshi did a robot-assisted uh, MIST lift at L5S1. Um, and, uh, you know, the details of the, of the sort of the indications and the, and the choice of the operation aren't really the focus here, but, but really the use of uh, 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 navigated spinal robotics. Um, and so Dr. Kreshi touched on uh, some of these points uh, already, uh, talking about robot assisted pedicle screw placement. Um, but the thing that I also wanted to reinforce again here was the notion of the, um, having a pre-op plan for the inner body placement and disc prep, and then being able to execute that exact plan uh, with the assistance of the robot uh, to sort of uh, get the best uh, sort of optimal result. Um, and I think this is a good case example of that. You can see uh, on the upright panel, um, the navigated the tube placement, um, the, the uh, plan for the inner body and then superimposing the active work with the curettes over that, the, that uh, preoperative plan uh, and so forth. Um, just wanna to touch on two papers I thought were relevant um, to this topic and also to some of the discussions in the chat. Um, this is a paper that just came out uh, uh, about a couple months ago. It's an interesting meta-analysis. Um, this The group looked at a total of 1,525 patients um, that uh, underwent either robotic-assisted or traditional freehand pedicle screw placement. A total of 777 patients were in the robot arm. And they showed uh, significantly higher odds of, of accurate pedicle screw placement with the robot arm, lower odds of proximal facet joint violation, reduced intraop radiation time and radiation dosage with the robotic arm. They did interestingly find that the length of the surgery was significantly higher on the robot arm to the point of uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, panelists uh, in, in the chat. But to that end, I also wanted to bring up uh, a second paper out of uh, Nick Theodore's group at Hopkins. Very interesting look at the learning curve uh, as it pertains to operative time. The blue uh, dots here correspond to the operative time for the robotic patients, and the red line is the freehand. And you can see that over time, the, uh, the, the, the time duration of the case for the robotic cases actually uh, uh, became lower than the freehand with the learning curve. And so I think that's uh, an important point um, uh, to make when, when these, these issues are being discussed. Um, and so I'll, I'll stop with that um, and uh, we can move on to the next case, but thank you. All right, thanks, Ahilan. Um, so I think we're uh, gonna move on now to uh, 
Mike uh, Steinhaus. Mike is also one of our current fellows. He was uh, one of our really outstanding residents at HSS. And uh, again, we were lucky enough to keep him uh, here uh, for another year of fellowship. Uh, Mike's going to be talking about uh, um, use of uh, navigation and minimally invasive techniques outside of the lumbar spine. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Thanks so much, Dr. Kreshi. Yeah, so I'll be talking about MIS, posterior laminoforaminotomy techniques. Um, and so we'll start with a case. Um, so again, I'll try to be brief because we have one more to go through. But basically, this is a 61-year-old male who presents with right scapular and radicular arm pain. Um, the symptoms began about four months prior without any event. Um, he finds that this pain is constant, starts in his scapula, and radiates down his medial forearm. Um, he also finds that um, he has some weakness in his right hand. Uh, just his exam pertinent findings are this that occurs with neck flexion. He also has a positive spurlings. Um, his motor examination is significant for weakness in right finger abduction, adduction, um, and thumb abduction. Um, otherwise, he's neurologically intact. He does have some decreased sensation down his right medial arm and, and forearm. Um, and here's his MRI with left mid and right parasagittal cuts, as well as an axial cut at T1 and one, two. Uh, main pertinent finding here is uh, T12, there's a right sided foraminal disc protrusion causing severe right neuroforaminal stenosis um, with compression of the right T1 nerve root. Um, uh, before we get into treatment for the patient, I wanted to go over a couple of uh, techniques and papers um, here. Uh, again, I'll be kind of brief uh, just given the time constraints, but here was a paper done by um, Dr. McEnany and Dr. Qureshi um, back in 2015 going over the technique for minimally invasive cervical foraminotomy. Um, and here's just showing the setup. So um, here, this is a patient position prone on a Jackson table with six posts. The next the neck is placed into gentle flexion to decrease um, cervical lordosis, and the, the bed is placed into reverse Trendelenburg to aid with visualization and to decrease bleeding during the case. Um, lateral x-ray can be used for um, localization. Uh, oftentimes, given the um, location of the pathology, an off-axis lateral is needed um, at some lower levels, which can be more difficult to see. Uh, here's just showing uh, the setup once the tube is placed. So this is a 14 millimeter um, tube. So a 14 millimeter skin incision is made just adjacent to the spinous process on the site of pathology. Um, dilators are used, go again, going up to a 14 millimeter tube. Um, fluoroscopy um, or navigation can be used to confirm the level. Um, so again, here's what this, the final setup should look like with the retractor arm facing toward midline and away from the surgeon. Um, the lateral radiograph here used uh, is to confirm the correct level. Um, next, a combination of a high-speed burr and kerosene rongeur is used to perform the lamina foraminotomy. Um, the goal here is to identify the pedicle at the caudal level. Um, the foraminotomy can be continued until the lateral aspect of the pedicle can be pal palpated, which translates to about one-third or one-half of the medial facet. Uh, here, we'll skip this video. This is just showing us the nerve root. We'll skip the it falls here. Just to look at a couple studies, um, comparing open and MIS um, techniques in cervical foraminotomy. Um, so this was a meta-analysis looking at open versus MIS um, posterior cervical foraminotomy for anatomy done by Dr. Kureshi's group in 2015. Um, they found uh, a total of eight studies, five of which reported on open techniques and three on MIS uh, techniques. Um, they um, reported a pooled clinical success rate was similar between the two groups, 93% and 95%, concluding that there was no significant differences between the techniques in terms of um, clinical outcome for these uh, patients. Um, this is another literature review um, comparing uh, outcomes between MIS and more traditional open posterior cervical foraminotomy cases. Um, and again, uh, just to summarize, um, they found uh, significantly um, better VAS neck pain um, in the MIS group on the acute uh, postoperative period. They also found reduced hospital length of stay and reduced pain medication requirement uh, for the MIS group. And one major question surgeons and patients have with regard to this approach um, is, am I going to have to revise this patient to a fusion down the line? Um, this is a study by um, Dr. Kreshi's group in 2014 attempting to answer this question. And basically what they found um, was a very low rate of uh, 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 fusion um, after a posterior foraminotomy. So at the index level, they found a rate of 1.1% per index level per year. Um, and at the adjacent level, it was 0.9%. Per, uh, per year. Um, so they found um, and conclude that this is an excellent al alternative for patients with radiculopathy, um, secondary to foraminal stenosis or a lateral um, disc. 
And finally, um, this is a retrospective study looking at current trends in the treatment of single level um, cervical radiculopathy. Uh, and essentially what this boils down to is the vast majority of these cases are um, still um, ACDF, so it's about 72, 73%. Um, total displacement um, increased in use uh, from the 2010 to 2012 period of 7.7% up to 16%. And the foraminotomy group actually decreased in use from 20% of cases down to 10%. Um, they found OR time um, for a foraminotomy group to be shorter than both the ACDF and the total displacement group. And length of stay, they found ACDF to be longer than both foraminotomy and displacement groups. Otherwise, they found no differences in outcome measures or complications, but we just thought this is an interesting um, study to show use over time. And then lastly, this study was actually just recently accepted, um, looking at time and radiation associated, associated with the skin-based um, 3D navigation and posterior cervical laminoforaminotomy. Um, this is a retrospective evaluation of 21 patients with 36 operative levels. Um, they found that time for setup of the navigation was 34 minutes um, with a median nine seconds of fluoroscopy time for the spin and uh, only zero to one seconds additionally for the procedure. Um, in, uh, in terms of complications, in one case, a second spin was required, and in two cases, the 3D navigation was actually abandoned and switched to traditional fluoroscopy. Um, length of stay um, was a median of six hours post-op um, with two thirds of patients going home the same day. So based on this data, the authors conclude that interoperative navigation using skin-based technology is uh, efficient, it's safe, and minimizes radiation to the patient and practically eliminates um, radiation to the OR team who can stand behind a lead. Um, uh, shield. Uh, just getting back to our case, um, so this, this is a patient with the right-sided T12 disc. He was taken to the OR where an MIS posterior lamino foraminotomy was performed. Um, and again, uh, this is just showing um, intraoperative microscopic uh, pictures. You can see on the left the T1 lamina and T2 lamina. It's a little um, fuzzy, sorry for that, but the T1 nerve root is there outlined by those red, um, those red lines. And then you could see the annulotomy performed on the right side with gentle retraction of the nerve root um, cranially. Sorry. Um, here's just showing incision planning with that skin-based navigation um, uh, system. Our pointer here is localizing the right side of T2 pedicle. The incisions made in dilators are sequentially used until the final 14 millimeter tube is um, docked into place. Um, again, the pointer can be used throughout the process to ensure the trajectory and docking position haven't changed. And again, um, once the overlying muscle is dissected, this is what you should see. So this is a different case looking at C67 level, but with the same idea. So in summary, um, MIS techniques and technological advances um, have made posterior foraminotomy an efficient procedure with low blood loss, a reduced postoperative pain, and reduced hospital length of stay. Um, for the right patient, this is a great approach. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Steinhaus. We are going to um, bring up the CME slide real quick, and then we're going to continue on with the last case and record the content. And if you need to leave, you certainly may, and the recorded content will be available on SSF TV. So here's your um, time to claim your CME credit. You text the code 482 to that phone number that you have, and then follow those instructions. Uh, I have dropped that information in the chat box as well. And then um, why don't we get started then with Dr. Aluri's case, and then we'll have that content for uh, anybody who wants to see it post. And if anybody needs to leave, feel free. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Linda thanks so much. And uh, yeah, sorry, we're running a little over. Uh, Kieran Aluri will present our last uh, case of the evening. Uh, Kieran uh, did his uh, residency training with uh, Jeff uh, Wong at, uh, at USC and is uh, spending the year with us. Uh, Karen, thanks so much for presenting this case. All right, sounds good. Um, I'll try to go fast in the interest of time, but this case basically is a case of adjacent segment disease trying to highlight some of the technology uh, for intraoperative imaging and navigation that Dr. Qureshi mentioned in his first talk this evening. Uh, but basically, this is a 59-year-old female who presented in June of 2020 with about 50% back and 50% leg pain. Um, Previously, she had an MIS T lift from L4 to S1 in July of 2017. She did very well for almost a year and a half, but then she started to develop back pain. And then in March of 2020 and then June of 2020, she started to develop both back pain and left worse than right radicular pain. Uh, this radicular pain went to the buttocks and anterior thigh. She stated she couldn't sit, stand, or walk for more than five minutes. And she was attempted to be managed with conservative management, but she eventually failed. Um, her physical exam, really unremarkable, except for decreased sensation in the bilateral anterior thigh region. And um, other than that, her motor exam was normal. She did have some pain with range of motion of her lumbar spine, but other than that, not much uh, significance. 
Um, these are her most recent EOS Scully films from June of 2020, uh, before she underwent surgical intervention, which I'll show in a minute. But basically, you can show, you can see she's got a right-sided lumbar, a right-sided lumbar curve, left-sided thoracic curve. Uh, but she's got good chronal balance. She's just slightly off to the left. Um, and then sagittally, she is actually balanced, but there's some compensatory mechanisms in place. Her pelvic tilt's elevated, as you can see in the numbers. And um, it's difficult to see, but she does have some hyperlordosis at L2-3 and L3-4. Um, I was just trying to show on serial radiographs here her images over time. They're, these are not dedicated uh, lumbar spine films. They're just zoomed in EOS films. So um, the clarity is not as clear. But what you can see is um, there's some adjacent segment disease on the far right, uh, most significant at T12L1 and L2L3. Um, actually, not so much at L3L4, which you would have thought would have happened. Uh, but this is, you'll see this better on these uh, upcoming CT images. Um, quickly, just to go through her MRI. Um, T12L1, or basically on her sagittal profile, you can see degenerative disc disease at T12L1, L2, L3 with some end plate changes there. Um, but there's really not much significant uh, central stenosis at T12L1 or L1, L2. Uh, maybe some moderate central stenosis at L2, L3 and L3, L4. Um, and then the previously uh, instrument level, uh, which had the T lift at L4, L5 and L5, S1, you can see there's no residual stenosis. It's very well decompressed. How can you tell uh, it's healed? How can you tell the, the previous fusion's healed? Uh, you, I, based on the images I've previously shown, you cannot, but I will show you a CT scan where we can better assess that. Um, I just wanted to quickly go through her. I don't know if this will play. It doesn't look like it is. Oh, here we go. Um, these are just her T1 parasagittals, but you can see on the right, she has some uh, foraminal stenosis L2, L3, and then much more foraminal stenosis from T12, L1, L2, L3, and L3, L4 on the left, which is the concave side of that scoliotic curve in the lumbar spine. And then, so this is the CT images. A couple of things I wanted to highlight um, was the adjacent segment disease at T12, L1, and L2, L3, which you can see on the sagittal. And then on the coronal, you can see some lateral listhesis at T12, L1, L2, L3, and L3, L4 with end plate changes. Um, L, the, with regards to the healing, it looks like L4, L5 is healed um, but L5S1, maybe not. There was a bit of screw lucency in the uh, bilateral. I thought they were both pseudoed, actually. Yeah. Um, and so that's why we, you know, when we took her back, it was hard to know whether her symptoms were from a pseudoarthrosis or from uh, adjacent segment. But uh, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't think that she was fused at, at these levels. So uh, to summarize, 59-year-old female, three years out from an L4 to S1 T lift with symptomatic degenerative scoliosis adjacent segment disease, likely pseudo, uh, and also some new onset bilateral, likely L2, L3 radiculopathy. Um, so this patient under, ended up going stage surgery um, for her first procedure, uh, which was, I believe, on a Thursday. She underwent T12 to L4 lateral lumbar interbody fusion, and these cages were placed uh, using the navigation technology that Dr. Qureshi previously mentioned. And then for her second stage, which was, I believe, on a Monday, she underwent um, uh, percutaneously uh, instrumented uh, fusion from T12 to the pelvis um, using CT navigation. And so this is her image on post-op day one after the first stage surgery, where you can see the um, multi-level lateral lumbar interbody fusion. Um, you can see there's nice, there's not much correction, but basically her previous uh, sag alignment is maintained. Um, and then she went back to the OR on that Monday, which was about three days after index surgery. And then she got standing films on post-op day nine. And these are the final images. And then four months out, which I believe last month, these are most recent images. Coronal curve is maintained um, and her sagittal profile is maintained relative to pre-op and she's doing relatively well. Um, she's back to all activities, um, working with physical therapy, no longer using a walking aid and her walking tolerance is much improved. What's the chance of this being her last surgery? That is, nobody knows. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a toughie. I mean, when you've got a pseudo, which could be the cause of the back pain, you've got disease above. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really hard call. And I mean, obviously we're all challenged with how much surgery is enough versus too much. And then, you know, obviously we've got a fusion to the, just above the TL junction and, you know, it, it, you know, it may hold up, but she lives long enough. 
you may get a you know something junctional yeah i think uh i think with all with everything that we do i mean the the chance of it being the last surgery is uh is, is generally unlikely it's just a question of whether patients are willing to come back or not my my other question for shiraz the first case that you showed which was you know, a very something we all see, which is a 5 1 spondy with L5 redix. And obviously, I mean, I've, I've met some of the guys, special surgeon, you've got some good access surgeons. What's your decision tree on whether to do something anterior versus an MIS posterior? How do you kind of figure out in, in that, like for this particular case, yeah. whether you want to do something anterior versus MIS posterior? Yeah. So I, you know, I generally, for if it's a single level degenerative uh, disc issue, I, I will do an A lift at 5.1. Uh, above 5.1 at 4.5, I usually prefer um, a posterior approach, like an MIST lift, and then above that, usually a lateral. For this patient mm -hmm. in particular, one of the things um, he had a foraminal disc herniation sort of superimposed at L5, which I thought was the reason for his acute radic. And mm -hmm. I talked to him about just doing a discectomy, uh, but he had enough back pain and, uh, and I was worried enough about his instability that I wanted to fuse him at the same time, which was a reason to go uh, posteriorly on him. I also don't like the thought of us, uh, like if I'm going to go anterior, I usually go for a single level issue. I, I want to do it in a scenario where then it's a standalone operation where I don't have to go into their back at all. Um, and if I have to go in their back, then I'll generally, you know, just do, uh, an, an MIS T lift at five one, but curious to hear everybody else's thoughts on that. That makes sense. Rick or Jack. I mean, what do you guys think? Uh, well, you know, we're, we're big time a lifters. So yeah, no, I know. So I asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we're, you know, we're lucky to have really good access surgeons who reliably and safely get us there uh, all the time. So it's easy for us to, uh, to do it from the front. Yeah, Todd, I see, Todd, you joined, You're, you love doing A-lift for lytic spondies. What do you think? Yeah, I'm an A-lift guy too. I'm an, I'm an honorary Texas Back Institute. <laughs> <laughs> we let him in the club. <laughs> we have fantastic, we have fantastic uh, access surgeons. It makes such a difference. I didn't have access surgeons like that at Jefferson, but I still prefer to do A-lifts. You know, I, I, for me, an A-lift is a spectacular operation. Yeah, and I'll go with, with Shiraz because I'm, obviously I'm with Rick and Jack and I love, I mean, I'd say 80 to 90% of the stuff I do is ALIF. But if there is posterior pathology that requires decompression, I would I would go posteriorly and do a T-LIF uh, in, in those circumstances. And, and actually, you know, in, in, in real, realistically, it's, it's the minority of the stuff I see. But if there's posterior pathology that requires decompression, you're there. You might as well just take care of it while you're there. It, it, a poster operation is a great operation, but like what we've learned from all this like um, overwhelming amount of X lift and all these things has been, it is incredible in a revision situation to not have to touch the scarred dura and get an indirect decompression. I gotta say, like I was not for it. I was in the rabble against it, but there is something to be said to never have to go back in that area that has been violated, you know. There, there is, you know, there, we've been to a couple of meetings lately, particularly in Australia, and there is a, a, a burgeoning body of, I wouldn't say evidence, but of opinion that even a first time recurrent herniated disc to go anteriorly and, you know, pull out the disc from the front and do either an arthroplasty or a standalone ALIF. I mean, it's, it, it the, the, the opinion is definitely out there among pretty well-respected guys. I will yeah, say that the, of, sorry, no, I was just going to say the ability to do lateral has been nice because it, it has, or sorry, the ability to go anterior or lateral, whatever you choose has been nice because it's made me more aggressive in offering decompressions to patients because just like Todd said, I'm not afraid of the scar tissue or worried about getting a fusion or any of that stuff because I feel like we can access those levels mm -hmm. and you can be a little bit more aggressive about saying, let's try the decompression. And if it doesn't work, we have so many other options. Yeah, Scott, I think, you know, it's interesting. I was in uh, France a few years ago and they were, they showed case after case of recurrent herniation where they were doing anterior approaches and then doing arthroplasties on those patients, which. I mean, know. it's incredible to think about, I mean, it changed our whole mindset to say first time recurrence, 
I don't want to go in the back with a scar. I want to do something anteriorly. And, you know, obviously the, the payers, the insurance companies are never going to approve that, but you know, it, it's not an unwise thing to do. But, frankly. But Scott, and, and like you, you know, said, it, outside the U S they're doing it more and more. It, they may be doing it more and more, but what we need is data and we need to have long-term data because we all know that patients that have recurrent discs, some just have strictly leg pain and they do fine with just a revision discectomy. And others we see that we do a lot of artificial disc on, they've had horrendous back pain. But the problem is you can't predict that patient that's going to develop the horrendous back pain. So I think that's still very aggressive until we have data, you know, until we have registries and long-term follow-up. I mean, that's, that's the real answer. It's not just because they're good and respected guys that are recommending it. I mean, where, where's their data? That's, that's what we have to make our decisions on. And, and that's where predictive analytics and, and you know, and artificial intelligence and, you know, and that's where we, we need, like you said, we need to have the data to know which ones you just go back and through the scar and pluck out the disc versus the ones that you go in the front and do something. And, it, it, you know, it's just like what they're doing for the uh, deformity. You know, they're applying a lot of that data, but, you know, I don't think they perfect enough to know who, for example, you raised a question about that patient having the fusion and, you know, is that going to be their last operation? maybe with AI and predictive analytics, we'll be able to determine, well, Mrs. Jones, you're definitely coming back. You have a 90% chance of needing more surgery. Or, you know, Mrs. Jones, you have a very small chance if we go up to a certain level. I mean, so, I'm going to rein in on the technology parade here. So this is a magnificent um, uh, and wonderful presentation. And I really don't want to be a technophobe, but having played with databases now until I'm losing my last hair, I'm going to look like <laughs> you, Rick, uh, by the end of next year. Um, this AI stuff is way overrated unless we're willing to look at the surgeons also uh, and, uh, or the institution. Uh, this is a really big and very touchy subject. So if we want to go there with AI and see this as the great mecca and it will happen whether we like or not united healthcare as we know is keeping a very detailed database on every one of us as we're speaking um uh, we have to be willing to look at these hands or our hands and our minds and how we think and how we execute and um the the refuge of large-scale data analyses is not at all there um at this present time. And again, if we wanna look at large scale data and see where we are right now and where the flaws are, we can look at the United Kingdom and we can see how the NHS database uh, has limits and nobody has uh, larger scale data than those guys. So, so whenever I hear predictive analytics and AI, I start getting kind of a little uh, contracted, con involuntary contractions somewhere. Well, especially if it's skin. misused, Jens, and it, it, it dictates care rather than follows or tries to even predict care, but it dictates care, which is what's going to happen. Hey, guys, this has been wonderful, but I think... Uh, <laughs> Are you cutting us off, Jack? We're just yeah, getting warmed up here. Well, Dr. Geyer has to leave because the French prostitutes need that room. <laughs> so <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's time to wind it up. But yeah. thank you very much, Shiraz. You and your guys did just uh, fabulous. Fabulous, wonderful job. Thank you. Great, Great session. Terrific. Thank you, guys. Thank Thank you, guys. guys. Everybody Thank stay you. safe well, up there. Thank you, SSF. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.